Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for a webinar from the Homelessness Policy Research Institute. Uh, because this is the first time that we've been able to broadcast uh, quite widely, um, we have a symposium series that is meant to really bring together researchers and policymakers, practitioners, people with lived experience to talk about some critical issues on a quarterly basis. Um, but because the audience is probably wider than it has been in the past, I thought I would just let people know that the Homelessness Policy Research Institute exists and has a goal to accelerate equitable and culturally informed solutions to homelessness in Los Angeles County. By advancing knowledge and fostering transformational partnerships between research policy and practice. Today represents an opportunity to do that. Um, today we have a wonderful panel. Um, I'm first going to introduce uh, Lauren Dun Dunton, who is a researcher and senior associate at APT Associates. Uh, she has more than a decade of experience in conducting research and evaluation on homelessness and providing related technical assistance. And recently she provided, uh, she was the project director for a, a Health and Human Services and HUD funded study investigating city responses to homeless encampments and the associated costs, which is what she's going to share with us today. Um, as you see, it's titled, entitled Responses to Homeless Encampments, A Look at Four City Responses in 2019. Now, the purpose of today is to not only reflect on the lessons learned um, from the responses in 2019, but certainly to think about what does it mean today in the midst of the current pandemic that we face, and, and what does this mean for our most vulnerable um, uh, populations here in LA County and beyond. So with that, uh, we're first, I'm going to first turn it over to Lauren to begin her presentation, and then I will introduce the panelists after Lauren concludes. Lauren, thank you very much. Thanks, Gary. Okay, so um, thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, I just wanted to again reiterate that our findings are from uh, 2019, so prior to the COVID pandemic. So um, as Gary mentioned, um, our study was co-funded by HHS's Office of the Assistant Secretary for Policy and Evaluation and HUD's Office of Policy Development and Research um, to learn more about um, encampments and um, cities' responses, uh, cities' approaches to responding to them. So the findings from the study are really intended to help federal, state, and local, local policymakers um, understand what cities are currently doing. So there are several parts to our research. Um, first, we conducted a, a literature review of both peer-reviewed and gray literature, um, as well as interviews with eight key informants back in uh, late 2018. Um, we then moved on and selected uh, nine cities that are displayed on the slide um, in consultation with HUD and HHS and the Interagency Council on Homelessness. And uh, we did phone interviews with those nine cities and then we, um, last fall, uh, conducted site visits to four cities, Chicago, Houston, San Jose, and Tacoma. During those site visits, we interviewed um, many implementation partners, collected cost data, um, actually went and observed the encampments, and then conducted interviews with two people with lived experience in, at an encampment each of, in each of the cities. Um, so first, I want to talk a little bit about um, what, what are encampments. So um, we looked at this question through literature review, the telephone interviews, and during our site visits. And what we heard is that um, across all of the, the cities, um, there are more uh, encampments that are becoming visible and uh, are located in public places. And we heard about that being a result of decreases in undeveloped, um, vacant, or um, less visible spaces in the cities. So first, um, what is an encampment? Uh, we found that there really is no standard definition. Um, there's no federal definition at this time. And at, uh, in the absence of a common definition, cities over time have developed their own definitions. In some cases, cities have um, made formal definitions either established in statutes or policy, while other cities had informal but shared definitions. So when we looked across all the definitions we found, um, we, we could identify some common elements. First, we found that encampments had to have some continuity of location. So this is really what uh, differentiated uh, just kind of standard unsheltered homelessness from an encampment. People had to be um, in one location multiple nights in a row. 
Um, we also saw that there had to be at least several people residing at that set location. Um, it, there has to be, and some definitions had, you know, a lower bound of three or five people to, to be considered in this uh, encampment. Um, and then we saw much larger ones as well. Uh, the encampment also, to be an encampment, you also have to have a presence of physical structures, um, such as tents or lean-tos, or we saw broken down campers or buses um, or cars, as well as also personal belongings. And these were numerous bicycles, coolers, mattresses, tables. Um, and then the last element was really a sense of social support or community. So people living in encampments um, are really looking out for each other and maybe even helping each other with daily living tasks, such as cooking or cleaning or watching each other's belongings. So um, encampments locations varied a great deal. I think most traditionally people think maybe about more urban encampments. So on the right side of the slide, you see a picture of the Hamilton Pierce encampment in Houston. Um, encampments are um, in Houston and other places located on sidewalks, under highway overpasses, in parks, near central business districts. Um, we also heard in Chicago where there were encampments that are located in the underpass tunnels or viaducts under Lakeshore Drive, as well as um, lower Dra Wacker Drive under the Loop. Um, and then Las Vegas encampments um, under the Las Vegas Strip and tunnels and storm drains. So that's kind of one environment for encampments. But then we also heard and saw a lot about um, more secluded encampments. On the left side of the slide, you see an encampment along Guadalupe Guadalupe Creek in San Jose. So uh, out of site locations such as creeks or riverbeds, um, underground tunnels built into hillsides, um, common uh, in San Jose and some other West Coast cities. Um, in Tacoma, we saw encampments in wooded areas with vegetation and trees. Um, those uh, encampments may pose a different set of challenges such as environmental degradation, water contamination from human waste, or habitat destruction. And uh, it also can be challenging to um, both serve people via outreach in those locations and also make clearing and prevention uh, efforts challenging for cities. So um, we also looked at uh, how encampment size and structures differ. So um, encampments really do vary in size. We saw smaller encampments with just a dozen people to um, really large encampments of sometimes over 200 people. Cities often have a mix of both small and larger encampments, but some cities have a predominantly one or the other, one or two very large encampments, um, and, and then, or some cities have more smaller encampments. It's important to remember that the size of the encampments are really fluid. People are entering and departing encampments on a daily um, or several day um, rotation, and that can make service provision and also counting number of people and their characteristics and encampment settings really challenging. Um, when thinking about structures, we also found that the types of structures and encampments can vary a lot. Some encampments are, you know, more informal structures, blankets and tarps. Um, others have, again, more established tents and um, broken down vehicles um, that, that kind of help uh, create that built environment. Um, we also, I talked about the presence of common belonging and supplies. Um, we saw in some encampments that there's like shared supplies or common belongings. So shared dining tents and restroom tents. And also one encampment we visited had stocks of general supplies and household items that different encampment or res residents could share. Um, we also observed that encampment residents really treated um, these places like their homes. They're, they are putting shelving um, and doormats at their tents. Um, they're adding furniture and really trying to make the environment as comfortable as possible for them. So I also want to spend a couple minutes to talk about the characteristics of encampment residents. So across all the cities that we studied and read about, um, we found that people are in encampment settings from all ages, race groups, ethnicities, all genders. Um, but we did, looking across all that, um, find out that most encampment residents are adults and they're more often men than women. Um, there's currently not a requirement to report uh, at the federal level, at least specifically on people living in encampment settings. And I mentioned it can be challenged to 
do enumeration because of the fluidity of the population. Um, but from some of the data we did uh, hear about in, in the cities we visited, we found that they tend, encampment residents tend to have higher rates of disabling conditions, substance use disorders, and mental illness. We also heard from homeless service providers in those cities that um, people with severe mental illnesses tend to live in more isolated settings, so they don't necessarily want to be in a social situation and, and may be near encampments, but kind of off to the side. There were uh, several encampments that we heard about or observed that had specific subpopulations. So in San Jose, we heard about very small um, encampments that were um, most residents were either transition age youth, another encampment where folks were uh, veterans. And then in Minneapolis, we heard about a, was a larger encampment that was comprised primarily of uh, people of Native American descent. And then another thing that we observed in two of our cities was that there is a higher percentage of African Americans in the encampments than there are in the city's overall population. Um, contrary to a lot of um, media kind of reports that have been published, we found that encampment residents often have lived in the city where they're camping um, prior to becoming homeless for quite some time. They're not just recently arrived there and then decided to live in an encampment setting. Um, in San Jose, we talked with one woman who actually was living in the neighborhood where she grew up. She'd been priced out of housing and she chose after living several other places to come back and camp in her community because it really made her feel safe and it made her feel like she had some connections. We also explored uh, reasons that people are currently forming encampments. Uh, across the board, we heard the most about uh, severe shortages of affordable housing. I think that's definitely the case most, um, maybe most prevalently in California. Um, we also heard about many shortcomings in the shelter systems. So first, the lack of shelter beds, so just insufficient shelter beds for all the people that need them, but also barriers to entry for the existing shelter beds. So people may not want to be separated from a partner or spouse. They may have a pet that they don't want to leave behind. There may be sobriety requirements that are not appealing to them. Uh, there are also maybe rules of the shelter program, including curfews or program hours that also don't allow for employment or other activities. Also, literature and implementation partners uh, that we talked with cited people have concerns about their personal safety in shelters as well as the security of their belongings. So they actually feel more secure uh, in an encampment setting, sometimes because of that sense of community, than they would in a shelter space. So encampments, that sense of community and safety um, in numbers is better than shelter, but also better than being unsheltered as an individual. And sometimes we found those relationships are uh, even serving as a surrogate family for people that may not have much of a social network. Um, however, we also read about instances or heard about instances where the sense of community could be negative. So people are really um, forming encampments around negative habits, such as drug use. Okay, so I'm gonna sh shift gears here and talk about uh, cities' responses to encampments. That was really the, the crux of our research. Um, so again, disclaimer, reminder that this is in 2019, so pre-COVID. Um, as part of our literature review, we created a two-part, oh, sorry, a four-part typology. And we found um, when we went out and started talking with communities and visiting the four cities, that really cities are simultaneously um, implementing more than one kind of of the categories in the typology we defined. So uh, looking across the four cities of uh, Chicago, Houston, San Jose, and Tacoma, we really found that they're all converging on, on kind of a similar strategy that involves clearance and closure of encampments with significant res uh, support for um, encampment residents leading up to and during that process. So there's a major focus on outreach and engagement prior to any um, clearance and closure. So the ultimate goal for the cities is to close the largest encampments and have those residents permanently relocate, um, hopefully to some type of shelter or permanent housing. Um, and they're working through intensive outreach to connect them to those services. In three of the cities, um, they're also part of the key part of their response effort has been to create additional low barrier shelters Sometimes those are called navigation centers. San Jose was the only city that had no plans for additional shelter at the time uh, of our research. So because as I'll talk about later, a lot of the funding for, for encampment response is coming from the city themselves. There are limited resources and limited staff time. So cities are really forced to prioritize their response to um, usually certain encampments. 
So we found that some cities have formal um, prioritization strategies, some have more informal prioritization strategies, but looking across them, we kind of found that the three things they're thinking about are whether encampments are located in highly visible locations or very large in size. Um, are encampments posing significant health, safety, and environmental hazards, both to encampment residents themselves, as well as the surrounding city or community? And then also they tend to prioritize um, encampments that are generating significant public or political pressure. Okay, so now talking specifically about the encampment responses, there's really kind of three uh, steps that the cities are taking. The first one is to um, clean the encampments. On a, uh, often this is on a regularly scheduled basis, um, every month or two weeks, um, where the cities are going in and providing basic sanitation, um, removing trash, providing trash bags, uh, emptying any uh, sanitation, porta johns or anything that's available, and removing any larger um, uh, personal items that are no longer being used. Uh, Communities use this as a touch point for outreach as well. Street outreach workers are, are typically present at these types of uh, cleanings as well as uh, sanitation staff. Notice is posted 72 hours in advance of the cleaning. And then some communities, most notably Houston and Chicago, are then kind of doing these more um, periodic deep cleanings. So they're uh, certain times of the year performing more thorough uh, cleanings where they're asking people to leave maybe for a day or two. They're really getting in there and doing significant cleaning, biohazard teams, um, maybe replacing um, fill dirt or something to make the environment um, more, more clean and sanitary. And that's also another major touch point for outreach workers. There's more um, implementation partners that are typically present at those types of deep cleanings. So this, the second step would really be then moving to a clearance and closure situation. Um, again, the clearance and closure is usually only happening at some encampments. Cleaning may be happening um, at many encampments, but then certain ones are prioritized for this clearance and closure process. And leading up to a clearance and closure, there's again going to be very intensive, purposeful outreach. There's notice, um, advance notice posted of, about the clearance and closure via signage and also um, outreach teams usually step up their visits and interaction with encampment residents uh, leading up to the clearance time. Um, this can include members of uh, police homeless outreach teams as well. Uh, and during the day of the clearance, there's gonna be the outreach workers as well as sanitation workers and often members of the hot team, homeless outreach teams um, will be present to help um, people leave and also offer to help store their belongings. Uh, many of the, many cities now have uh, available storage for people living in encampments for, for 90 days or 120 days, the city will store personal belongings free of charge. So they'll hand out bags and then collect the bags and give people um, tags so they can claim their belongings uh, at a later point. And then after the closure, there's going to be a um, clean cleanup of the site by city workers to remove any remaining structures, abandoned tents, other um, debris, and then they're going to try to, again, mitigate the environmental impact on uh, the encampment location, physical encampment. So cleaning the area, replacing the soil, um, maybe uh, any other kind of deep cleaning that needs to happen. Um, one criticism of this strategy is that it can often exacerbate the challenge of getting uh, encampment residents into shelter or permanent housing. Often during these processes, there can be a loss of personal documentation, which is really key to helping people get into permanent housing. And also it disrupts the relationships that outreach workers have been cultivating with encampment residents for a long time. We heard that sometimes residents choose not to take emergency shelter or um, are not able to move into permanent housing right away and then they relocate to another encampment and, and that can take a long time to find them again and reestablish that report. And the third step in kind of in cities uh, responses is prevention. So in this phase, this doesn't happen everywhere, but it's often for larger encampments or encampments with larger um, negative environmental impacts. Uh, cities are erecting fencing or other physical barriers, big boulders, um, something to prevent people from returning to that location and reestablishing the encampment. This also may be a point where police are starting to enforce any no camping ordinances that have been on, on the books in that city or county. So as I mentioned, outreach is ongoing and intensive. It's a key um, part of all cities' responses to encampments. 
and outreach workers are investing significant time building rapport and trust with encampment residents. Uh, cities are contracting with established homeless service providers to conduct the outreach activities. And in talking uh, with outreach staff in, in the cities that we visited, we heard a lot about them working on pre-navigation and housing navigation with encampment residents. So really focusing on helping them gather identification and other documents to allow them to apply for housing assistance or other general assistance, and then also helping them um, um, be assessed for coordinated entry and accessing other housing. So in addition to these homeless provider um, programs that offer street outreach, there also are specialized outreach teams. So I mentioned ho um, police homeless outreach teams. These uh, specially trained officers um, work one-on-one -on -one with people in uh, living in encampments and their job is really to build rapport and serve as another type of uh, referral to services that are available and housing. Um, they also can enforce any laws uh, around camping and ordinances and can make arrests if they observe illegal activity, but those uh, members of the HOP team that we spoke with said that that's really kind of a, a secondary priority and they prefer to use a carrot rather than a stick approach. There also uh, are in many cities um, medical and substance use outreach teams specifically that go out and visit encampments and offer services for mental health and substance abuse. Chicago has an on-site uh, medical care unit that visits encampments and makes referrals to the clinics. Um, in San Jose, there's a backpack medicine team that goes out and provides basic medical services in the encampments as well. So as you can imagine, um, coordinating all of these different partners to have a unified uh, encampment response is a big effort. Um, and there are many partners across city government, other organizations that are involved. So we found that city government is typically has the lead role and establishes the strategy for an encampment response and then is responsible for coordinating all the implementation partners. So we found that it's really important that there is a clearly designated uh, lead within the city government to have a clear path for decision making. Partners um, are very wide ranging, but often include police departments, city sanitation and parks departments, other city departments such as um, uh, housing departments, sometimes neighborhood or um, neighborhood departments are involved, and also home service providers. Um, in the in the four cities that we studied, the COC is really a separate entity and um, run either by the county government or, in two cases, nonprofit organizations. So they are not directly involved in the planning of the encampment response, though the city is coordinating with them to make sure that there's a link to the coordinated entry system and uh, to the outreach providers. And I just wanted to spend a few minutes and talk a little bit about the um, key, en key encampment activities in each of the four cities we visited. So I'll start with Chicago. Um, the photo on the screen is of an encampment in Lower Wacker Drive that we observed when we visited in October. So the city of Chicago is really focused on downsizing um, their existing encampments. So they have a formal um, three-level prioritization uh, strategy where they're prioritizing large encampments and ones that generate the most political pressure and they get the, um, the largest level one or level two response. So in Chicago, because of Illinois state law, they can't um, prohibit someone from sleeping in a public place. So they're not able to close an encampment. So they are working to downsize. Um, and they are able in certain circumstances to remove structures, but generally they're really focused on outreach and trying to connect people with services. Um, in the couple cases, they've, they have been able for extreme situations to try to move people by fencing off an encampment. Um, the encampment has just moved down the road. So um, the a key part of the strategy in Chicago has been that they opened the first low barrier emergency shelter in the city. So the 28 bid Pilsen shelter is available only to people um, coming from encampments and they actually move the entire encampment that they're working with together into the Pilsen shelter at once. So they're really trying to preserve that sense of community um, and get everyone to move at one time. And then from the Pilsen center outreach staff and Pilsen center staff continue to work with the um, encampment residents who are now in emergency shelter to get them to, into permanent housing.
In Houston, uh, they have been really focused on closing their, um, they have four or five um, larger encampments and they've been focused on closing those. The city closed the Wheeler Street encampment in 2018 and a notable um, part of that closure was that they timed the closure of the encampment to the opening of a permanent supportive housing project. So they were able to move many people directly from the Wheeler Street encampment into permanent supportive housing. Um, in 2019, they launched an initiative called Har uh, Housing Harvey's Homeless, um, and they are now aiming to permanently house residents of the now largest encampment, Chartres, which is downstairs or downtown, not downstairs, um, close to their uh, their um, baseball stadium. Uh, and the city is also working to open a temporary emergency shelter in the nav kind of in the navigation center model um, in 2020. In San Jose, um, there's obviously just as many people on the call are, involved, are either living or working in California or both. Um, there's just many more unsheltered homeless um, living in encampment settings uh, and a scale well above the other cities that we visited. So um, there's just a, a, a level of, of uh, need and coordination that's greater than some of the other cities. So there are many encampments, though some are smaller and many are located along local waterways. The uh, city formed a partnership with the Santa Clara Water District to work on clearing and closing encampments along the waterways to mitigate the growing environmental damage that was coming from people that were living in those locations. Um, of the cities that we studied, San Jose was the only city that experimented with a sanctioned encampment. So from 2018 to 2019, Hope Village um, was opened and the city really wanted to see if it offered a low cost way to provide people a place to stay while they work to find um, permanent housing. So at the peak, it, it, there were 20 people that were living at Hope Village and uh, the program was managed by the county and um, sorry, funded by the county and then managed by a local faith based group. But their lease was not uh, renewed after six months, um, more to a technicality that it was determined that it was too close to the airport. But uh, the implementation partner shared with us that the city doesn't really feel that a sanctioned encampment is something they want to continue to pursue. And then lastly, in Tacoma, um, they really started um, their formal encampment response. Uh, in 2017 after a major encampment called the Jungle, which is located under um, a highway overpass outside the city, uh, was cleared. And in response to that, they created the temporary, uh, temporary mitigation site, which was kind of an outdoor space where they moved everyone to and people could move their tents to this outdoor space. And then a few months later, they opened um, the stability site, which is shown on the slide. It's a pop-up tent. And um, they are then, uh, people move into the stability site and provide intensive um, services on site and uh, assistance to securing uh, permanent housing. So the stability site is still in operation um, today. And then in 2020, uh, the early part of 2020, the, the city was planning to um, open temporary emergency micro shelters to help clear a, a new encampment that emerged in People's Park. And then they're also looking to expand uh, the capacity of the local rescue mission and their emergency shelter. So the last thing I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about is the cost of encampments responses. So this is a key part of our research on site. As I mentioned, we, we did collect cost data from as many implementation partners as we could. Um, and we collected data mostly for the fiscal year 2019. So just wanted to write a couple highlights from what we learned. So first we looked at the cost uh, of encampment responses by activity type. So as you can see um, in the blue on the left, the greatest expenditure across all four cities, again, this is Tacoma, San Jose, Houston, and Chicago, um, is the cost associated with outreach services. So this includes um, engagements of residents, case management, and housing navigation services. The second highest expenditure, uh, expenditure category is related to uh, encampment cleaning and clearance. Uh, in two cities, you see there's costs associated with prevention. Um, and then uh, that's the purple bar. 
And then um, there also are two cities, Tacoma and Chicago, where there are significant costs related to shelter. Again, we, as I just talked about, Chicago opened this Tilson shelter, and then Tacoma was planning to open these two kind of new shelter facilities in 2020. So the full cost may not be reflected of those programs in the 2019 year, but there were some costs that they were um, undertaking at that time. So next we looked at spending um, on encampment responses by type of organization. So here, um, obviously there are many partners involved in responding to encampments, uh, and these included various city departments, homeless service providers, and as well as independent authorities. So in three cities, Chicago, Houston, Tacoma, we saw that uh, homeless service providers carried out half or more of the city's encampment response. Kind of the difference here is really San Jose, where 57%, the green bar um, of cost is related to, um, were incurred by the Santa Clara Water District. Uh, again, they're very involved in working to, to clear and close encampments along the waterways in Santa Clara County. In three cities, um, the, in Chicago, Houston, Tacoma, the police, police department actually counted for about a quarter of all expenditures. So those were homeless outreach teams. And then at San Jose, they have a street crimes unit that works uh, specifically with uh, homeless encampments. And then city departments also accounted for between 19 and 21% of expenditures. And then lastly, I wanted to talk about the cost of encampment responses by source of funding. So implementation partners did not necessarily provide funding for their own activities. The big takeaway here is that cities were by far the largest funder of um, encampment responses, funding between 35 and 97 percent of all the activities related to um, encampments. So just a couple things I wanted to point out here. Um, in Houston, the, the top uh, line on the, on the bar graph, um, there is uh, a bigger share of federal funds there because of the permanent supportive housing that I mentioned for the Wheeler Street encampment. Um, there are other federal funders, HHS and HUD, and also local independent authorities, uh, as well as private funding kind of scattered through all the, all of the cities. But again, this, the city is really encouraging, incurring the, the biggest cost here. Um, in San Jose, that 59%, again, is, is the water district. They're really providing a lot of funding for encampment response activities. So um, our report is still in federal clearance, so it's not public yet, but we hope it will be soon. Um, the literature review that we conducted in 2018 that is available um, on HUD and HHS's website. Um, and then we will have a final report, the city approaches to encampments and what they cost, uh, as well as a shorter brief version, strategies and costs of responding to encampments in 2019. And then we also wrote um, specific site summaries for Chicago, Houston, San Jose, and Tacoma. Uh, and those will be published as well. So um, thanks everyone for listening. And if you have any questions, you can feel free to follow up with me. I'm the project director, Jill Kaduri, who you're gonna hear from in a few minutes. She was a principal investigator. And then uh, Nicole Fiore was uh, the San Jose site lead. So if you had specific questions about San Jose, you can feel free to call, follow up with her. Thank you so much, Gary, appreciate it. Thank you so much, Lauren, for providing uh, critical context for you know, what encampments are and how various cities have approached them and also to provide us some hints about what are the challenges in coordination and, and those kinds of things. Um, um, as Lauren noted, she already welcomed your questions. We have questions coming into the, the webinar and, and what we're gonna try to do at the end is to provide a time to answer some of your questions. We will certainly likely not get all of them answered during this time. And if there are unanswered questions, please reach out to us at HPRI or to any of the individual uh, panel participants to get more insights from them. So with this, I'm going to go ahead and transition to our panelists and um, and just let me briefly introduce them uh, all three to you um, who are all terrific in, in, in their work as researchers or in providing direct service. Um, Jill Kaduri is someone that I've had the chance, privilege of knowing since we both studied housing vouchers and public housing back in the 90s. And she's currently the founding director of the Center on Evidence-Based Solutions to Homelessness. Uh, she's a principal associate and in the Social and Economic Policy Division of APT, and also a former director of, of, of uh, Policy Development Division of the Office of Policy Development and Research at HUD. Uh, she has recently 
co-authored a new book with Mary Beth Shin, which is called In the Midst of Plenty, Homelessness and What to Do About It. Um, Amy Turk is with us. She is the Chief Executive Officer of the Downtown Women's Center. It's the only organization in Los Angeles focused exclusively on serving and empowering women experiencing homelessness. And she's held various leadership positions in the fields of social work and homeless services since 2001. And our third panelist is Stephanie Klasky Gamer. She's the President and CEO of LA Family Housing. Uh, she has nearly 25 years experience in, in working in various kinds of social and economic justice work. Um, in depth, she has an in-depth understanding of housing policy and development. Um, as president and CEO, she drives the organization to fulfill its mission, overseeing all aspects of its operations, including the development, finance, real estate, and program design and management. So normally we would have the opportunity to express our appreciation of all of our panelists, including Lauren, um, but without the uh, fanfare, I, I, I want to transition to the panelists. And Jill, I'd like to start with you since you are also on this project, and I just again appreciate you joining us here today. Can you share how the lessons from the study that Lauren presented apply to the post-COVID world that we face now? Thanks, Gary. Um, yes, I, I've been thinking a lot about that. And Lauren, I see you still have your slides up. Um, um, could you go back to um, slide number eight? So as you can, as, as Lauren said, and as you can you know, see on the slide, um, people don't feel safe in encampments. Um, they, um, they, they go to, they, or they, excuse me, people don't feel People don't want to go to shelters. They don't feel safe there. And that's because of concerns that people will steal their belongings or that they might be physically assaulted. It must be much more the case now that people don't want to go to shelters. Uh, physical distancing may be difficult in encampments, but it may be much easier to spread out than it is in shelters. And I think we know that um, just being outdoors rather than in a confined space helps avoid infection. Um, as droplets dissipate and are not carried across indoor spaces. Um, of course, it depends on the location of encampments and the places we studied, spreading out does seem to be feasible in many cases. In Chicago, for example, um, the viaducts under downtown highways extend for miles. Uh, that's one of the reasons that it's been difficult to prevent encampments from Forming in Chicago, people move to another um, location along those uh, along those underpasses. Uh, in San Jose, the natural areas around waterways um, are extensive enough to permit physical distancing. So, Lauren, if you could go to slide twelve. Yeah, so what I've said implies that unless they have an alternative that's safer than congregate shelter, cities should stop clearing encampments during the pandemic. I've been really shocked to hear that some cities are still clearing and closing without necessarily providing safe alternatives. Um, the cities we studied were already focusing on sanitation for the encampments that had not been cleared or had not been cleared yet. Um, that obviously should be stepped up with more hand washing stations, more toilets, and if possible, given the nature of the location, portable showers. Um, as more testing becomes available, health authorities should make encampments a priority. They might also take advantage of the fact that people in encampments often know each other to help with contact tracing for people who test positive. Um, we know that many cities are using hotel rooms as temporary safer locations, for example, to relocate people from shelters when they test positive, to downsize shelters in general, and also to persuade people to leave encampments. Um, clearly, that use of hotel rooms um, is a reasonable temporary policy, although I do worry about the disruption of relationships that outreach workers have formed with encampment residents. So what happens next? Are some of these hotels going to become permanent housing? Can that be done without reconfiguration? Um, for example, to make them into permanent housing, there would have to be space made for kitchens. And would that kind of capital investment be the right use of resources? Um, I would prefer to see an expansion of affordable housing, in particular housing vouchers, so that people can have the autonomy associated with having a place of their own rather than a bed in an enhanced shelter. So Gary, does that yeah. does that, that does. 
question. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much, Joe. Um, Amy, um, I'll go to you next. And I, because the Downtown Women's Center is such a full service provider, having, you know, providing both, um, you know, kind of interim housing and permanent housing solutions, and in addition, providing uh, assortment of services. I wonder how your work on the front lines has shifted, you know, from the pre-COVID world to the post-COVID world. Thanks, Gary. Um, so nice to hear about everyone's work thus far. And um, I, one of our major shifts right now is to support 55 women in our, our hotel initiative through across California, the Project Room Key Initiative, and really overlaying our existing housing resources to those women so that we can focus uh, on their exits into permanent housing. And thankfully, we've done this with existing resources. The Downtown Women's Center has been very focused on implementing the model called Domestic Violence Housing First. And the resources we have for this model are through the California Office of Emergency Services to provide flexible funding and mobile case management support to move people safely into permanent housing or in some cases help them stay permanently housed where they're at with the financial support. And we've helped our community expand this model through some piloting of programs through our continuum of care through LA Homeless Services Authority. Uh, Downtown Women's Center is uh, taking some time to plan for expansion of this model through the new HUD DV bonus funding uh, that will start in our community in November, in October, November, um, where we intend to serve a little over 100 women using the domestic violence housing first model. Uh, we've been in partnership with the Economic Workforce Development Department with uh, other uh, services that focus on social enterprises and combining that with the needs of domestic violence and human trafficking survivors to get cash out the door as fast as possible to people that have uh, lost income due to COVID. Uh, we've focused a lot on ut utilizing our problem solving program, which is also a local, local initiative um, to help people quickly resolve homelessness, which of course will um, inevitably increase due to the economic in impacts of COVID, which fall heavily on women. Uh, this is a time and a recession that impacts the jobs that women hold. Um, and the jobs that still remain are predominantly filled by women of color in essential service frontline work. Uh, so we will continue to invest in um, everything it takes to keep people housed, rehouse, and find the economic stability through employment or other avenues. Um, and we've just been noticing that uh, the, the collaboratives, collaboratives that have been built in Los Angeles are really mm -hmm. serving a purpose right now. For example, the domestic violence housing um, excuse me, the Domestic Violence Homeless Services Coalition is moving into its fifth year. And the trust that's been built in that coalition has allowed us to immediately pivot into advocacy um, and work related to ensuring that there are hotels, new hotels available for domestic violence survivors um, and people experiencing homelessness, as well as having a real keen eye to the long-term needs of the population that we serve. So those are just some of the examples of how we focus specifically through a gendered lens at this time. That's great. Thanks, Amy. I, I've certainly heard in all three, in both the presentation and, and what you said, Jill and Amy, just how critical it was to have really strong networks of coordination mm -hmm. prior to this crisis and how they, you know, it sounds like from what your work is uh, describing, Amy, that this has been even more important as you mobilize uh, to, to provide unique solutions. Um, so I'm going to turn over to Stephanie, but before I do, we're just going to show a very brief video of an opportunity that LA Family House to actually help move an encampment into permanent or interim housing. And then, so then they take all your stuff and put it in here, okay? And then they're going to put you in a separate van with everybody. Not because So today, LA Family Housing, in partnership with the county, 
with Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority and all of our partner agencies are moving people into a new Project Room Key Hotel. This is an encampment with about 50 individuals who are connected to each other in various ways. It also happens to be predominantly African American. That was real important to us, recognizing how disproportionate the black community has experienced death within COVID-19. It's the first time we've moved an entire encampment. Because of the community and connections within that encampment, we felt it was very important for the success of those individuals if they were able to move together. COVID-19 has really presented an opportunity for us to invest the resources needed to bring people indoors. We're going to bring thousands of people indoors. This is just the first step. After being underneath that bridge for so long, it's a pleasant relief. I see a bathtub, we can go soak in a bathtub. Um, we have a daily shower, we have food being brought in. You're not struggling as much to get your basic needs met. This is somebody's brother, this is somebody's mom, somebody's auntie, somebody's uncle, somebody's dad on the streets. And we all need to be helped. So that's incredible. Stephanie, can you share a little bit about the uh, unique opportunities and perhaps some of the barriers that you face and, and actually being able to move this encampment into a Project Room Key Hotel? Yes, thanks so much. And thanks for including me on the panel today. I really appreciate being here and being able to share, uh, as you said, this unique experience of our work with the Bradley Paxton encampment. One thing I want to um, just back up and discuss, we've been working with the community living at Bradley Paxton. It's the name of two streets in the Pacoima neighborhood of Los Angeles, the city of Los Angeles within the county. We've been working with that encampment for about 18 months. They've been living together as a community and there's lots of, much like what both Lauren and Jill described, well, Lauren really in her presentation of the um, dynamics of an encampment in terms of these positive familial like relationships. They've been living together as a community for the past four and a half, five years in this neighborhood. And we began working intensively with them about 18 months ago um, in somewhat of a non-formal sanctioned encampment. So we had funding from the county and from the city council member's office to do this extensive outreach with our MDT teams, multidisciplinary teams that include a mental health professional, a, a physical health professional, a peer advocate, meaning folks from our staff with lived experience, and our housing navigators. So much like uh, Lauren's report discussed, we bring that team of partners together it, through all of our outreach work and the housing navigation is so huge. As we know, California has the largest unsheltered population in the country. Here in Los Angeles, 75% of people experiencing homelessness are unsheltered. So our outreach teams are not just about, do you need water, do you need a blanket? Have you made it to a doctor's appointment? It's doing all of your document work to get you ready to move into permanent housing, and that's why a housing navigator is part of the team. With COVID-19, we saw an incredible immediate response to things we had been asking for for years. We got the washing stations, we got um, you know, the toilets, we received uh, city services to pick up trash at all of these encampments. Those are efforts we started a while ago at Bradley Paxton to begin to build that trust with this community. And when the opportunity presented itself with Project Room Key, Meaning once we had, uh, so LA Family Housing as a homeless service provider and a real estate development company, like Amy's team at Downtown Women's Center, we are also partnering with the county and the state on Project Room Key. We have four hotels right now, uh, providing rooms to about 490 individuals. When we received one of our hotels, which is a 240 room hotel, 
it presented this very unique opportunity to be able to lift up the entire Bradley Paxton community together and move them together into the hotel. One of the challenges we've had over the years in moving individuals of that encampment into permanent housing was leaving each other. So once we have this opportunity to move them all together, we jumped at it. And that this particular hotel, the 240 unit one, um, became actually a site for us to move multiple encampment communities into this hotel. So after Bradley Paxton, whole community moved in on the first day, that's about 52 individuals. Uh, then we started in the Sepulveda Basin and then we went out to the Tahunga Wash and then we went to all these different pockets of encampments. And it's really their first step. And I appreciate what you're saying, Jill, that you know, should we be investing in Project Room Key when we need to be building affordable housing and permanently affordable supportive housing, they're not one or the other. Right now, there's a resource that we're able to use with FEMA that we didn't have, and we just don't have enough supply of housing stock in California, and particularly in Los Angeles, to move people into permanent housing, which is why they stayed outside for so long. So we see this as a very first step, and now we are all working aggressively on the exit strategy um, to move people into permanent housing from these project room key sites, but at least it gave us an opportunity as the video showed to move them all together and maintain that bond that is, you know, supporting each other through this crisis. Thanks, Stephanie. And, you know, I, I again heard the, the critical nature of that coordination, but also of the trust that it takes a long time to build that trust, both with individuals and with, you know, these communities who are kind of self-organized in encampments. I, this is a question for all the panelists. Um, you know, what do we know from research or practice pre and post the pandemic that can provide some insights into how we ought to approach outreach perhaps differently than we have in the past or um, actually kind of the way that we coordinate with especially our community continuums of care, the COCs, if you will, because they those kind of court are sit in very different places in very different communities. Certainly Amy and Stephanie can speak to that coordination here in LA and Jill, maybe you can speak to it um, in other parts of the country. So lessons for outreach. Yes, Stephanie. Um, I actually think our outreach work in Los Angeles has been incredibly coordinated and it, mm -hmm. it started about three years ago, probably with the infusion of Measure H funds, which was our um, county sales tax mm -hmm. that, uh, that is funding supportive services, but um, a huge amount of those dollars are placed in outreach. So there is a lot of coordination in our outreach now. What I will say is different with COVID is um, two things. One, we did not have, despite outreach workers asking for this for so long, we did not have city resources brought to these encampments, whether it's the washing stations, the toilets, or the city services to do regular cleanups. Mm -hmm. They don't wanna live in, in chaos yeah. any more than any one of us wants to live in chaos. And so being able to just have a regular system of picking up trash outside of these encampments, I think what we've seen with COVID with this mm -hmm. immediate infusion of dollars and resources is it's effective and it's working. And so I hope that will continue what, even when COVID is gone, that we continue to support um, sort of health and safety standards within the encampments that, that our outreach teams can help facilitate. Amy, maybe we can go to you next and kind of talking about the situation here in, in LA and, and then we'll move to you, Jill, to talk a little bit about what your, what your research has shown throughout the country. I think some of the lessons pre and, and during COVID mm -hmm. are found in the needs assessment. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I have a thousand copies in my office, happy to mail them out for folks. But um, Dr. Painter was their principal investigator on a um, community-based research. The Downtown Women's Center also led. Um, every three years, we do a report on the needs of women experiencing homelessness. And this last go around was an expansion to not just looking at women in our Skid Row community, but throughout the city. And, you know, uh, unsurprisingly and sadly is um, the, the result of systemic racism and the disproportionate impacts on, um, in this report, Latina and African-American women. And so now having a laser focus on 
areas around equity uh, as we're looking at resources, especially of who is obtaining permanent housing. Um, that's a huge conversation, especially for folks that have been moved into the, the hotel initiatives. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the, just really grappling with that as a community and making sure that the folks that get the outcomes of permanent housing are the ones that are most impacted by homelessness from the beginning. Thanks, Amy, for highlighting those, those uh, facts. Uh, Jill. Well, what we found in the four cities that we studied intensively was that they, this, this very outreach intensive um, um, strategy um, couldn't have been possible without the pre-existence of um, homeless service providers that who knew how to do our outreach. And so while the continuum of care programs are not actually funding the outreach, it's the city that's contracting um, with the homeless service providers, um, that coordination is actually working quite well. Um, a, more, a more challenging kind of coordination is um, how, do, how, how does the response to encampments connect to um, coordinated entry and the, you know, the allocation and prioritization of, of resources. And, you know, that's a, that, that's a difficult issue because, you know, should, in, should encampment residents be prioritized over people who um, are not encampment residents, but, but, but also have particularly high needs for permanent supportive housing? Um, we, we learned that in Chicago, the continuum of care was able to change its coordinated entry system in a way that removed some of the barriers that were keeping um, encampment residents from being prioritized for, for permanent supportive housing. Right. Yeah, that's, that's really helpful to think about. I, I think my final question, and then I'm going to turn it over to the project manager of HPRI, Ellie Shane, to kind of share some of your questions. So please continue to fill them in. Um, it's just to uh, reflect a little bit on what researchers ought to be doing and what policymakers ought to be doing to maximize learning during this crisis right now. So I can also bring Lauren back in. Um, so, so let me talk about, uh, first ask perhaps Jill and Lauren, you know, what do you, what do you think should be, researchers ought to be doing right now to maximize learning in this moment? You can start, Jill. Okay, well, for one thing, you know, making sure that everything that is happening is being documented mm -hmm. um, so that we get to learn from what's happening. Um, and, and also that some of these, you know, the, that, that, you know, as Stephanie was saying, as, as communities move to figuring out what happens next after these hotels, mm -hmm. um, that we um, set up good, strong logic models for those for, for those um, those next steps and then make it possible to be able to see you know to do research on on what works and and what has not worked as well Lauren do you have anything to add on that yeah I, I think I agree with Jill I think it's just documenting what's happening and also finding places like this to share you know, ways the communities can share what they're doing and there can kind of be a cross-pollination of ideas because I think everyone's heads down trying mm -hmm. to solve their problem in their community and like there can be lessons learned from other places because they're struggling with the same mm -hmm. issues. That makes sense. Amy and Stephanie, what can researchers and policymakers do to maximize learning in this moment to improve our systems? I think really focusing on people with lived experience right now more mm -hmm. so than ever. Um, that we're not making decisions too fast on behalf, but with. Mm -hmm. And you know, just a recent example, I, I heard an advocate with the DV Homeless Services Coalition reflect um, that when she was living through domestic violence, she's like, you know, I could actually, my abuser would let me go to the grocery store and let me be alone in a grocery store. And her statement um, motivated the, um, LA City Attorney's Office to work with the Grocers Association on getting outreach flyers out to grocery stores. Mm. So, you know, I probably wouldn't have ever thought about that. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, really focus on listening to the people that are living through this. Right. I, even though in our study, we were only able to interview two people in each of the four cities with li lived experience, we learned so much from those interviews. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Amy. Stephanie? 
your list of lesson, or lessons to be learned? I think um, much like Amy said, a few years ago, we really took a shift in Los Angeles in looking at things with a gender lens. Um, within the last two years, there's also been a shift in understanding sort of the racial inequities, not just the institutional racism that has led so many people into homelessness, but sort of the inequities in how they're transitioning out of homelessness mm -hmm. as well. And one of the reasons I mentioned in the video that Bradley Paxton was so, there were just so many ingredients in that particular case that worked well, but it was also a priority for us uh, because of sort of the racial inequities of how COVID is affecting different populations, their access to healthcare, their access to education, et cetera. Um, it was a high priority for us to mm -hmm. use that racial lens, lens in this strategy to lift up a whole community and, and prioritize their safety in shelter. And to, to those both points, thanks for sharing that, Stephanie. Um, for those in, in Los Angeles or outside of Los Angeles that want to learn, there were two very extensive reports produced. There was an ad hoc committee for, for women experiencing homelessness and for black people experiencing homelessness that, that really put a laser focus on, on these very specific issues that are before us here in LA and I, I, I suspect everywhere in the country. Um, Ellie. Can you ask the first question for the panelists? Yeah, I sure can. Um, please folks, keep your questions coming. I'll do my best to sort of uh, get to all of them as we have time. And Gary and Caroline, please feel free to, to cut me off if we're running close. Um, the first question I have is for uh, Lauren and Jill on sort of the research study. Um, and, and folks are asking, were you guys able to look at the quality of relationships in outreach and engagement? And someone else asked if you were able to look at the number of people who were placed into either shelter or housing in each city. Sure, I can start with those. Oh, feel free to jump in. Yeah. So um, we did not specifically look at the qualities of relationships and in, in outreach engagement. That was kind of beyond the scope of this. I mean, we did we did interview um, as Jill meant, we interviewed people with lived experiences and we talked about the you know experiences with outreach, but that really wasn't the main focus. Um, of our research, and we did also, um, you know, talk with outreach providers and, and street outreach workers. Um, but I think that would be a really interesting um, study. It just wasn't really the focus of what we were looking at. I don't know, Jill, if you have anything to add to that? No, that's good. And there was a um, lot And then, yep, it was about um, people, did we look at who was moved from encampments into housing or shelter in, in each city? Was that correct? Um, we did not. Um, I think in some cases, um, we, the city did provide some, some data on that, but it was not uh, the, the focus of our, again, of our research. And um, I, I don't think that necessarily that's even different cities are tracking in different ways and it's, it's not a simple kind of thing to, to look at. So in our reports, there may be mention of a specific instances, like for example, in, in Houston, we know how many people move from the Wheeler Street encampment into permanent supportive housing because that was when they were very closely tracking. Um, but, but it's not something we, we holistically reported on site by site. Thanks, Lauren. Um, this could be, I think, a question for all of you. Um, someone asked if you could comment on the recent court order to clear uh, LA freeways of homeless encampments and what uh, the biggest concerns are um, that you guys have around that, if any. So this is Judge Carter's ruling uh, that looked at the unhealthy um, um, contributing factors by living underneath a freeway or adjacent to a freeway. You saw with Bradley Paxton, it was right under a freeway underpass with the on-ramp uh, just about a block up. So the challenge with it, um, much like Jill said, moving an encampment, clearing an encampment without a logical place for people to go next, it sort of begs the question, which is more unhealthy? To leave a community of people where you feel safe, where you have, you know, structure set up, both physical and social structures set up, as many of these encampments have, moving that and disrupting that order, or moving them because of the environmental elements affecting their health. It's a challenge if we don't have a place for everyone to go. And right now there's just a little bit of a, 
between our city and our county. Los Angeles County is made up of 88 cities. The city of Los Angeles, the order was brought against the city of Los Angeles, but they need to work in partnership with the county of Los Angeles because that's where all of our homeless dollars, health and human services dollars come from the city uh, providing much of the housing resources. So um, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. I keep asking my outreach team since the order came down, I think it was just last Tuesday, a week ago, uh, from Judge Carter. I keep asking my outreach team, have you guys been given direction by our funders, you know, to do something differently? We already are working with a lot of encampments that are under freeway underpasses already, but um, it hasn't been implemented. The order has not been implemented yet. Someone else said, uh, science is telling us that the safest place for everyone is outdoors. Um, what do our panelists think of the idea of using sort of large vacant lots and um, sanitation trailers and large uh, shade tents uh, with makeshift navigation centers um, as sort of an option for the COVID environment right now? I mean, it, it uh, certainly seems like a, oh, a short-term approach, um, but the conversations we're having is just, you know, how do we fund the long-term to, you know, Jill's and others have mentioned, like, we, we already do not have enough funding for rental subsidies, operation for supports for permanent supportive housing, if we're using COVID relief dollars to acquire hotels, how are we going to run those long term? So I think it's it's a balance. Um, there, we've now discovered safer ways to shelter people outside, um, but is that is that what we want to be known for years from now, or do we want to permanently house people? On that note, we have someone um, internationally here from Cape Town, South Africa. Um, who is working on homelessness in that country. And she's asking um, for advice on how um, we're working with hotels to be part of the solution right now during COVID-19. Does anyone have thoughts on what it's been like um, to sort of uh, forge that new partnership? I can speak to that, Amy, if it's okay. And then chime in. Uh, you're right next to me right there. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, only because we're working with four different hotels. So it's four different kinds of experiences and they're, they're pretty unique. Um, I, think it, the, I think spending time educating the motels who you are before you start, much like trust is a huge commodity in our homeless service delivery in terms of our relationship with our participants, Likewise, that trust is a huge commodity in our relationship with the hotels. We're experiencing one big challenge actually right now in uh, this larger hotel, the 240 unit one. The majority of the residents, the participants that we've brought in happen to be black. The majority of the um, housekeeping staff who never chose this work with our participants, but yet are working with our participants happen to be Latina. And there is um, some real racial tension in the operations of that site, so much so that we needed to double our staffing so that uh, housekeeping staff doesn't ever go to a participant's room without one of our staff members. There was just too many um, he said, she said's going on. And, um, but for the most part, it's going really, really, really well. There's also, in terms of the partnership of Project Room Key, we have uh, on site at all of the hotels, DSWs, disaster social workers, I mean, disaster service workers who are um, staff of the city and the county who are sort of volunteering to do this. Um, <laughs> and just the relationship with them, the, the community goodwill that's been going on because of working with all these DSWs, again, much like the housekeeping staff, they never chose to be in homeless service work. How and is, how, is food ser how is food service working? So we receive, um, uh, the county is coordinating with one um, food service provider and we receive three meals a day for every participant in each hotel and it gets delivered like every other day enough food for all the participants and then our staff and the DSWs literally, you know, deliver food every three times a day. It's what we've changed in terms of our staffing at the motels, again, just like the staffing of our outreach teams, it's in some ways no different. This is not meant to be 
temporary and then when it's done, bye-bye, best of luck. Uh, it's meant to be an opportunity to keep people healthy and safe while we are required to be safer at home for those that don't have a home. But it's also a, a really unique opportunity to have such a captive audience. And we get to see them three times a day because we're delivering food to them three times a day. So while they might be a higher paid staff than a volunteer DSW, we have our housing navigators on site at these motels so, and the hotels so that um, we are working on the housing placement process with all of the participants staying in the hotels. And that's been great. So the meals has been great um, because we're able to just have more engagement with the participants. Does anyone else have other thoughts to add on um, partnerships with hotels, Amy? I guess, uh, to be clear, the county did the heavy lift in terms of negotiating with the hotel, finding the hotels, negotiating with the hotel staff. Um, so that the nonprofit community hasn't been very much part of that. But to Stephanie's point, it has been an opportunity to provide a lot of education on uh, working with people who with complex trauma. Um, from hotel staff and all the other staff, the security that are that's there. Um, but from the, it, it's been really positive most times to see so many different cross sector folks coming together to support this initiative. I'm going to move on to another question, and perhaps uh, directed more at Jill and Lauren, um, asking about the partnership between the cities that you investigated and social workers and homeless community advocate groups um, in those cities and how um, those sort of groups work together when designing interventions and providing services and how decisions around cleaning or sweeping encampments were made across these cities. So uh, in the four cities that we studied intensively, um, the, the city is, re is really leading the response. So they're kind of uh, the, the decision makers, um, but working with a lot of, you know, other partners, including city agencies, also um, homeless service providers. It, it's not this, in these cases, it's not the COC that's leading those, those efforts. So while the COC is involved and there's often some coordination with the COC, it's really the city that's driving the response. So I don't know if that, Jill, if you want to add to that. The, the, we didn't talk about this, but cities tended to have um, um, some kind of a planning effort um, at, the, at the outset. And those planning efforts typically did bring in the advocacy community, which is not to say that there have not been ongoing tensions between the advocacy communities and the, and the cities. There have been. Thanks, you guys. Um, someone has a question for Stephanie around um, how um, encampment residents reacted when you told them that they could move together uh, into hotels. So sort of thinking about what Jill and Lauren were talking about in their presentation of the social connectedness of encampments uh, with that in mind. It, I said this to Gary the other day. I mean, there's a couple, you know, in a almost 27 year career, there's a couple highlights of your career. and. I didn't even own this effort. I'm, I don't come from a social work background. I've never done outreach except for shadowing my staff. I'm really you know, a real estate developer and there are milestones and projects that we built that are um, career changing. The day we moved Bradley Paxton was career changing. It was, it was a pretty phenomenal day. And uh, we had this big chartered bus and we moved like, 20-ish people at a time on the bus. So there was social spacing on the bus and everything. And one of my outreach workers, Carlos, he uh, jumped up on the bus when the first 20 people were up there and their belongings were already in our trucks and heading over to the hotel. And now the bus is going over the hotel. And he's, he was the one at the beginning, uh, just like showing a man that you're gonna put your stuff in, in this bag and whatever. He jumped on the bus and the first thing he said is, I told you so. And <laughs> there was, um, as we've said before, you know, trust is the commodity out here. And um, if we had just shown up to an encampment where we didn't have relationships, where we didn't know everyone's individual stories and the dependency of this person on that person, and that Sam was kind of the leader of the group and he kept the cleaning supplies, mm -hmm. you know, we knew those dynamics. 
And no one was going to go until Sam went on the bus. And we knew that already. If we just showed up to an encampment on the street today and said, okay, clean up your stuff and we're moving to a hotel, people would have said, you know, gracefully, <laughs> go away. <laughs> um, that wasn't the case here. They, we had been prepping them for this. We had been talking with them for months, not about COVID, not about Project Room Key, because we had no idea this was going to be in our universe, but, uh, but about moving into permanent housing and what that would look like. And we kind of had this unspoken understanding that we needed to keep them together. And we just weren't sure how to do it yet. We were looking at maybe LA Family Housing builds an apartment building that is entirely Bradley Paxton. That probably won't be very healthy, but um, <laughs> there was a lot of dynamics there. But I think it's because we had been working with them so long that there was um, there was a lot of appreciation that we kept them together. And we actually have asked them, they've set a tone at this hotel. It's 240 units. There's about 200, 240 rooms, a number of couples make that up. So there's about 270 people who live at this particular Project Room Key Hotel. And 50 of them, the first 50, were Bradley Paxton. And so we said, look, you guys got to step up and set the tone for this whole hotel. And there's kind of wings of the hotel. This is the Sepulveda Basin people. These are the Bradley Paxton people. And there's different personalities to each of those wings of the hotel. But they stepped up and they became leaders in this effort. Stephanie or Amy, on this point, have you had the opportunity to uh, learn from the folks who have been moved in either from encampments or, you know, were individuals living on the streets um, and, and whether the hotel has provided them, you know, either what they felt like they needed in that moment or and, and or maintain the relationships that they had with folks when they were unhoused. Yeah, I think, you know, just being there on move-in day was was uniquely special as well. And what I heard was just that the level of dignity that people were expressing to finally have their own space and their own bathroom. I mean, one woman was just in tears. She was just like, I can finally do my hair. I mean, these are just really basic needs, but having that space outside of congregate shelter, literally sleeping outside, I think spoke volumes to begin with. Um, and I, I'm seeing, at least among adult populations, that people are just they know the magnitude of this pandemic and their level of flexibility has seemed to increase, especially as so many staff are in and out. Um, and, um, but now really just like a, a what now? Like they know it's not gonna last forever and we yet don't have a response to. We don't know if FEMA is gonna extend the funding. We don't, haven't figured out all of the, all of the answers to give them as a system. Um, so I'm, I'm starting to see a, more anxiety bubbling up. Uh, the only thing I would add to that in terms of what we're learning from the participants in Project Room Key is, um, many of whom came from encampments, is, uh, this sounds, I don't know, naive or sad. Um, I think so many people who have lived outdoors for multiple years have forgotten that they actually appreciate a shower. Mm -hmm. And the shower has been the biggest thing that we have heard people appreciate. Like, yeah, a bed is nice, but whatever. The shower has been the biggest thing. And I think there might have been a mindset when people first moved in to the hotels uh, from the encampments that, um, all right, I'm here for a week and then I'm out of here. I want to go back. People haven't left. People haven't left the hotels and they're not, they're not on lockdown. I mean, we encourage them to stay in. The whole idea was social distancing um, and nobody has left because I think there are things that they forgot how much they valued until they had access to it. Great. I think we still have time for a couple more questions, Ellie. Great. Um, so uh, one of the, one of the participants here is asking about um, whether or not this, the evaluation looked at um, health risks or certain types of health risks or envi environmental risks um, for encampments specifically under freeway overpasses and, and ramps. And so I'm wondering both for researchers and for 
um, providers on the panel. Do you all uh, have any specific concerns or heightened concerns for encampments living in uh, close proximity to freeways? Uh, I can start. Um, we, that was not a, a specific focus of our research. I mean, we did try to, um, we did purposely select cities that were in different parts of the country and then had different types of encampments. So I talked about, you know, San Jose had some more um, like rural, or not rural, but encampments that were like along the waterways or in more secluded areas. And then Houston had, and Chicago had more like downtown, like urban environments. But um, beyond that, we didn't really look at the, the science behind whether, you know, th there's more pollutants or anything to people living in those different areas. I mean, what I can share is that, you know, when we talk with folks that were living um, in Chicago encampments and Houston encampments that were under overpasses or in tunnels, I mean, they were in those locations because they provided some um, protection from the elements. I mean, in Chicago, it clearly gets very cold there. And looking for some, I mean, people sleep outside year round and it gets very cold in the winter and it's protection from the wind and the snow and the rain. Um, it actually snowed when our, our uh, study team was there in late October. Um, and so that's one thing. And, and I went and talking with folks in Houston, I also heard that, you know, they really um, prefer um, all of their major encampments are under um, highway overpasses. There are a lot of highways that run through downtown Houston, but they, they like it because it protects from the sun because it gets hot there and, and also the rain. Um, and those, some of those areas are not as prone to flooding as um, the areas that uh, there were, used to be a lot of smaller encampments around the bayous. Um, in Houston, and one of the things we learned from implementation partners was that um, as the bayous have been uh, redeveloped as part of like uh, um, recreation trails and things, people have been pushed, experiencing unsheltered homelessness have been pushed out of the bayous and into um, more of the downtown area. And then, you know, that area also protected them from the flooding that Houston's experienced in recent years, especially Harvey. Um, the one thing I was going to add to it. Uh, certainly the environmental elements, the rain, the sun, etc. Um, but I also think that living by the freeways is much, uh, our participants are experiencing far less hostility by participants, I mean by um, pedestrians and business owners. So sleeping out on the sidewalk in front of somebody else's business, they're going to get a lot more aggressive behavior by um, not their peers. So there's a level of that protection. Protection. You're kind of out of sight, out of mind. Um, but the irony of this, in LA County, you can't even receive public dollars to build affordable housing if you're within a certain proximity to freeways. So the fact that we've known that for years, that there is a health crisis amongst people living near freeways, um, but we never were addressing it in our homeless population, there's whatever that just I don't know what it says, but it says something. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Ellie, maybe I, I one just, last just, question. Yes. Um, someone has uh, has posed a, a, a great question to end on, um, which is uh, given that um, many municipalities, uh, particularly in California, are experiencing a lot of fiscal distress right now. Um, do any of the panelists have examples of sort of short-term interventions and actions that private, private citizens and, and philanthropic and private organizations can do to sort of um, help finance uh, homeless services and support for people experiencing homelessness uh, as we grapple with COVID-19 and all of the kind of economic impact that that's having? Agree to lease your units. <laughs> the landlords out there with vacancies and you have a lot of vacancies agree to lease your units mm -hmm. and to the motels um, a lot of them sadly are not going to recover after COVID and they're not receiving the same rates from uh, the state the county or FEMA as they typically would have and so really where the private sector and the business sector I think can be most advantageous at this time is to encourage the sale of of those motels um, so that they can be converted into permanent housing and we can extend our or expand our um, portfolio of interim housing. I, um, you know there's been so many neat partnerships that have um, come out of this. Uh, a lot of folks who 
our traveling lists, including celebrities, have been really supportive of the cause. Restaurants have been partnering in new ways with homeless services, which is hugely helpful. Uh, medical companies providing um, PPE has been really helpful. Our philanthropic community becoming more flexible and moving from restricted to general operation support. Um, we, you know, see we we don't have much visibility into the future of our funding streams, although it, it feels as such that, you know, we really will be relying more on individuals and philanthropic support more than ever um, as our government is becoming more and more strapped. Um, and, you know, just the thought partnership has been really helpful among um, folks in this sector to help us kind of forecast and see ahead and support and help us think through the best ways to operate right now. You know, we, we really don't know. We have, um, we have no idea um, what kind of permanent resources are going to, are, are going to flow um, um, after these temporary resources go away or are, are exhausted. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that, um, that, th that this whole episode will um, teach the society um, just how broken um, the safety net is and just how, uh, how much more support people who are living in deep poverty need than they're, than they're getting now. But, but who knows whether that will come about. Yeah, I would just add that, and this is another question I saw in the chat, so I'll answer that too, but um, the our main report when it's released, it will have um, expenditure amounts for, for each city and annual expenditure for encampment responses. But I think just thinking back to, you know, a lot of the, um, the cities are providing a lot of money um, for these encampment responses and cities are going to be much more strapped. Um, we heard that, you know, the, the resources that were going to encampments were in some ways getting diverting resources from other parts of their normal um, kind of city services. So, uh, you know, I think as there's even more demand for city services and county services, it's, it's going to be challenging for to find resources for, um, for encampments and to help people living in encampment settings. Well, let me thank everyone who participated on this webinar. First, thank the audience who's out there who submitted a wonderful set of questions. I uh, want to thank Lauren and Jill from Apt Associates. We were able to use this opportunity of being physically distant from each other to bring you in from your location. So I really appreciate your, your work on thank this you. project. And, and we want to certainly uplift it as we move forward. Uh, I want to thank Amy and Stephanie for representing our our amazing provider community um, here on the ground here in LA County and for the work that, that you do. Um, I wanna thank uh, Ellie for running the question and answer session, did a great job and thank Caroline and Stacia for, for running the behind the scenes. You know, I think that um, what I saw it throughout the, the conversation today, which I've highlighted a little bit, is just the critical nature of these networks of trust and support in order for us to connect to people who are unhoused and to be able to bring them in in a way that's safe and also provides well-being to those folks. And while we are facing, you know, multiple crises from economics to continued facing this pandemic in front of us, I think that those networks of support, we, if we can keep them strong, will be actually be much better spot than if we start to fray on those. And, and I think finally, I think um, both Amy and Stephanie highlighted this in their work that, that bringing a particular and critical gender and race equity lens to the work is absolutely essential to do the work right and to do it well and to make sure that not only are we addressing issues upstream um, that have caused disproportionality among in particular black and native populations but also address kind of connecting people to the permanent resources that they need. Um, and so with that, let me just say that for, um, for those of you who joined us for the first time, um, HPRI, uh, it, it really is that uh, meant to be an intersection between researchers, providers, policymakers, people with lived experience to really generate new and effective solutions to people who are experiencing homelessness. If you have questions, um, we do have a research catalog um, that you can access online and many of your questions could be answered there. If it's not answered there, please send us an email. You can reach out to myself or Ellie or Caroline or Stacia and we'll make sure to 
Um, either if we don't know the answer, we'll connect to the people that have the answers and we can, you know, try our best to kind of write up a, a quick summary that everybody can, you know, access and appreciate. So with that, let me thank everybody again. And for now, we'll say, say goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.